is the Camp Baker Show. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Welcome back to this live broadcast of the Kev Baker Show right here on your number one network, www.truthfrequencyradio.com. And here we are, Christmas week, and tonight we have a real Christmas cracker lined up. And you know, for me personally, this is like a Christmas come early because we're going to be joined by Nano Girl. And Nano Girl really is the third member of of this team and she brings the sanity once a week to the madness that is KBS and not only that Johnny Whistles has actually managed to wake himself up from his slumber and join us on time tonight Johnny are you okay man you want a wee coffee I've got one here Kev <laughs> must have slipped into a coma last night oh, you, you know no, I think at the start person. of the show last night though Johnny some of that wookie cult of yours they honestly thought I'd maybe sacked you man <laughs> Never a chance of that, dude, is there? Nah, I wouldn't think so, Kev. I think uh, everything is quite all right the way it is. And tonight's show, John, I can't wait to get into it. We watched a three-part TV series just recently, Childhood's End, and um, this was an adaptation of Arthur C. Clarke's novel from the 50s. Nano Girls watched this, and Johnny, oh, so much to talk about. I was amazed. I was at... I- I was actually glad that I hadn't seen any trailers or anything for it, Kev. That was the thing. Absolutely, Johnny. So I spoiled a good bit of it. Without giving too much away before we get into it, could you head into the chat room and give all these great listeners a festive shout-out, man? I will do, Kev. And we start off with our Penelope. We've got Angel Angie Marie. We've got Bill, Brendan, O'Shea. We've got Carol Morgan. Oh, that's... Uh, the woman from Bells Hill, uh, Kev, and she's moved to Australia, and this is her, her own be part of Scotland, listening to the show, so good to have you here, Caroline. Uh, Caroline, in fact, sorry. Charlie, we've got Chris, we've got David Little, we've got David Sweaty, we've got Devlin, we've got Do One and All, Jeremy Trott, John Taylor, John Tita was here, we've got Joy, we've got Kenneth Webb, how you doing, brother? We've got Kenny, we've got Kev, we've got Kirk Hadley, we've got Law, we've got Mark, Matthew, Luke and John, no, sorry, we've got Ock Freeworld, how are you doing? And we've got Peter Collins and Peter Small, we've got Papa John, Whistles, myself, we've got Real Joe Wood, we've got Reese, Sam, Steve, we've got Time Lord, and the very last one, Kev, is Transpersonals. Absolutely fantastic. So was that down in Australia, you were saying, one of our listeners are, John? Yeah, it's, uh, came from Bells Hill. She left when she was only young, I think, Kev, and moved to Australia. But um, probably not lost the accent, Kev, because she sounds like a real jock. Absolutely. And we were just talking last night when you told me about this listener, how we would both love to go and visit Australia. It just looks so lovely down there. And, you know, I've seen a picture from our good friend Tempest just today, and he's taken up a new job over in Australia, and he's out in a boat, he's fishing, and I've never seen the big man looking so happy, and I want to give a big shout out and much love to Tempest. You know, it's this time of year we start thinking about all those connections we've made, and that had me thinking today about just the contribution that Nano Girl has made to the show. Every week I keep on reminding people just how integral a part of the show she is. And not only that, she brings the sanity, but she's also taught us all along the way. And that's why tonight for me, even after last night's brilliant show with another great man we've met, Ben Emlyn Jones, this for me is like an early Christmas present because we've got all the kind of stuff myself, Nano and John love to talk about. And here we are, like family Nano, hanging out on TFR. Oh, my God. You guys say the sweetest things. I feel the same way about you. It's an uh, absolute pleasure, privilege, honor to be here. It's been super fun. And you know what? I've learned as much as you have. You know, I mean, uh, you give me a reason to stay up to date on the tech and what's happening on the politics. And because we're connected worldwide, we know that I, you keep me reminded that things don't only just happen in the USA uh, or California, but 
all around the world, and it gives me hope. So big shout out, big Christmas warm wishes to all our listeners, everybody in the chat tonight. Woohoo! Merry yeah. Christmas! Because we do have, for whatever reason, some kind of quantum entanglement, we seem to share experiences now. This show, it's almost like the reality show into my waking up, learning, and spiritual growing. And I'm happy with that, so I don't mind sharing with people. This weekend was really, really dark for me, Nano, and I've got no reason to be depressed at all. Everything sorted for Christmas, got a lovely family, got a job. I'm in relatively good health, and when I look at other people around the world, I have nothing to complain about. But this seems to be a heaviness that's everywhere right now. Wouldn't you agree? I would. Last week seemed like it was about uh, three weeks. The week before that was only two weeks. Um, I think there was a lot going on. I felt like we had uh, a lot of people playing three layers of chess at the same time. And thank goodness for my wonderful person that you know I love, Catherine Austin Fitz. She did a recent interview with a uh, dark journalist, and she threw out a couple of things that I had not heard about, but is very relevant. And she kind of helped me move out of this sort of feeling of darkness and, you know, let's face it, we've got a lot of stuff that's kind of weighing on our shoulders. We're trying to do something, change something, make some difference. But she used some interesting words that I hadn't heard her use before. One of them was the adult fairy tale and getting out of hope and denial. In other words, don't be just waiting for hope and denial. But the other word she used, and I want to share this word with you because I think that if, when you use this word and you think about it, we just we need to remind ourselves to back out of their programming. She used the word entrainment. And it's brain entrainment is when strategically applied, it's a scientific way that they can actually create um, a, a new synapsis, a new way that connects to our brain. And they what they do is they keep on repeating and repeating and repeating and kind of doing things. It's actually at a frequency level. And so if we can just remember, it's like our pathways, our neuro, it, it creates neural pathways. And knowing that and thinking about that, and I, I heard the, uh, the interview yesterday and I thought, wow, but you have to, what we maybe can remember to do, Kev, is just back up a step and go, wait a second, is this really me being depressed? Or is this the, uh, as she calls it, the squawker machine, the shriekometer, she calls it, that's actually getting into the synopsis that they've put there frequency-wise, and I just need to pull the plug and walk away and just turn down the vol volume. And I think what was going on the last week definitely was the shriekometer would probably had to be on 15 and 10 was too high. And, you know, this is really, really relevant for tonight because... We're going to be talking about children tonight because of the show we've watched and how that all ties in with it. And Nano was talking about neural pathways there. And the children and us adults, we are all under some kind of forced evolution right now. And I was reading today, Nano, that children who are intensively gaming, they're actually rewiring parts of their own brain. And they're pairing up different neural pathways that are unrecognized or not very common in people who don't play games. Now, whether this is a good thing or a bad thing is still for debate because these kids are showing increased ep or aptitude at some skills in the real world. Now, again, this is all about reprogramming us, these neural pathways. And these games are so huge right now, especially with Christmas coming up. It's one of the most wanted kind of must-have things. And this show that we're going to be talking about it's relevant to this evolution of mankind. And this is a three-part mini-series called Childhood's End. And this is based off the 1953 novel of the same name by Arthur C. Clarke. Now, he originally took it from another short story called Guardian Angels. And the original book by Clarke is a seminal work in science fiction and has left a, visibly, a visible mark on the genre which may be why the story is at first familiar. Titanic alien spaceships appearing over Earth's major cities. And then the aliens, who we dub the overlords, quickly eliminate things like war, conflict, disease, famine, 
poverty. All, all the bad things, Nano, in this world. But here's the thing, and before they even reveal who they are, is this utopia, Nano, that is painted in the show with the arrival of these seemingly benevolent beings, is this all it's cracked up to be? And, you know, people might be thinking, well, this is a TV show. Why speak about this right now? And Nano Girl has spoke to us often enough and everyone across the network about this robotic revolution that is on. And one of the things that you see in Childhood's End, which really struck me, was what happens when there's no need to work anymore? When there is no struggle for humanity, what do you do? Some people go back to learning, stuff like that. But Nano, this utopia, is it all it is cracked up to be? Well, you know, that was one of the things that concerned me about the show, that they made it sound like, uh, in fact, they had some interesting quotes, if I can find them. But um, it, what did it, it was, let's see, it's been the destroyer of many worlds, and they reached the end of their time. I, I think the thing that disturbed me about it, Kev, was they, it, it's like there was only one view of it. It was like, okay, well, without a struggle without poverty, without this, you know, this just seems like, like a bad thing. You know, we're all going to go down a board road. We're not going to be creative. We're not going to do anything. Now, I know they did shut down the, the science aspect of life. Scientific but I mean, curiosity was gone. There was no need for it. And they actually showed up because they claimed that humanity was on the verge of achieving interstellar travel. And that I would not be allowed. I think the thing is that they chose what they were going to do rather than they, than they got to choose. In other words, it would be like you coming into my house and saying, from now on, I'm going to pay all the bills. You just have to do what I tell you to do. When I tell you to do it, you can do this much stuff, but you can't do that stuff. And the stuff that you really wanted to do, i.e. tech and all this stuff, you don't get to do that. Because I've decided how this is all going to be. And if you don't do it, you're going to be dead. That now that's that's the implied thing. So, under those circumstances, how can anybody really have any kind of creativity, Kev? Because it wasn't voluntary. This isn't something they evolved to. This isn't something they fought for and became. And that so, you surmise in this series that it's a bad thing, and that's how they end up on New Athens. And we have to appreciate when this was written. This was in the 1950s at the start of the Cold War. And you know there's a few communistic traits when you look at the world, the utopia that is painted in this. There's no God. It's godless. These religions in the story, they show somebody, a woman of faith, actually taking her own life to depict the struggle that would happen within people on the planet when alien beings turn up and I really do mean when and Nano before I come back to you I want to come to Johnny here because this was something that really struck Johnny and this is really quite worrying as well folks because these aliens turn up but they choose not to show themselves and they do that for 20 years now Johnny they choose almost like a prophet on earth and in the original book by Clark it was actually the UN Secretary General now, in this TV show, it was just a farmer from out in the sticks in the US who they chose to communicate through. Now, you never in the first episode of the show get to see what these aliens, this creature, what calls himself the supervisor for the planet, Karelin, actually looks like. And, you know, I was thinking about this, John, and if there is an alien race coming here, they've got interstellar travel, maybe transdimensional travel, they're going to probably look at our history and if they aren't of an appearance that we think we can or they think we can handle automatically, they may take the guise of some other more easy to appreciate form for the human beings. And what I mean is maybe they would appear to us as a religious figure and a kind of funny take on it after your take on the fact that they hid themselves, Johnny, and they didn't show themselves, yet the people were willing to give up all their powers and everything to them, even though they couldn't see them. You see, that was the crazy thing about it, because it was it was all done quite willingly. There was only one small um, uprising, really, against it, and that was quashed in the first episode. Um, 
But to go that far, uh, to, to go that long, Kev, do you know what I mean? Without seeing who you're doing all this, I mean, you're giving up everything, basically. Absolutely. It seems a bit weird. Handing well, over everything, Nano, to an unseen outside force. No matter how benevolent it may appear. What's your thoughts on that? Well, okay, I wrote down a couple of his quotes because I found them pretty disturbing, and you guys know I'm a heathen. Um, One of the comments was, uh, God makes you all feel confused and afraid. Faith is on its last legs because they give us ice cream. Um, No place for your faith now. You deceived yourselves. And when that woman, who's the shrink on the episode two, goes to help that kid, she chokes on her cross. That cross chokes her, um, which I thought was pretty powerful scene and um, a big, huge message from that movie. I, I found that part of it very disturbing because uh, the universe, the, the spiritual light does not make me feel confused and afraid. In fact, that's the thing that gives me my power and makes me feel like I have sanity. And I found it very disturbing that they that these were some of the comments and the things that were going on in the movie and i i, I don't know i i just anyway i just thought it was disturbing there there wasn't there didn't seem to be anybody who could push back on them and say well wait a second and also their reference to their higher self was the overmind it's and another ominous name they, like i said they turn up here they choose this prophet for lack of a better term, to speak for them, to pass their message, because they know that humanity is in no way ready to see their physical form. So the first episode unfolds, and right at the very end when the reveal comes, and they wait 20 years, 20 years, guys, to show themselves, and then open the doors, and out walk a big, red, horned hoof winged baphomet like something we would recognize as devils no wonder they hid themselves nano girl they had actually said in the show this wasn't the first world that they had visited before and they'd obviously learnt from some of their prior mistakes but just think of that and here's the kind of sick ironic joke i was going to make just when i was speaking to johnny and if they had been flying in and decided right earth's the next planet let's look at this the religious kind of history of the place to find out what would be the best form to take. Well, maybe they would look at the planet and they would see all the hypocrites that follow organized religion. They would see the fact that they wear iconography that depicts Jesus dying. People still celebrating the death of that character all these thousands of years on. They may then take a look at MTV for a look at the modern culture, see people like Miley Cyrus and all the latest music videos throwing up the devil horns inverted pentagrams and all the dark, sick, satanic stuff. And who can blame them if they thought to themselves, well, maybe this lot, they worship the devil. It's everywhere on Earth right now. Well, yes, you have a very good point. Now, I did read the book, and um, in the book, it's like 50 years after they've been on the planet, they show themselves. So it's enough time for people to sort of, quote-unquote, trust them. And to finally have peace and not be too shocked. And in the book, the thing that was very shocking in the book was he comes out with the kids all right, but they're on his shoulders. He actually carries them out because he's a very powerful being. Do you know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of that statue that was placed in Detroit, which shows the Baphomet and the children right beside them. Johnny Whistles, Mm -hmm. Nano. Was it not totally iconic of that? Of course. Mm Mm-hmm. No, go, Johnny. I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go, no, go. No, no, it's all right. It's just, Kev, that was the first thing that came into my head when I seen him coming on. You know what I mean? It was like something like the stars in your eyes when you come out through the smoke with the two kids, one in each hand, and my God. Absolutely. And as the show unfolds, Nano, you brought it up a moment ago. There is something which Arthur C. Clarke puts in his book called The Overmind. Now, this replaces God in this kind of set up from what I can see, and Karelin and these, well, for lack of a better term, demons, they work on behalf 
of the Overmind. Now, right now on the show, Nana, we always speak about this technological race that we're having into the future and what problems may come along with it. And it interested me that in this show we had these other beings, Corellan, the height of technology. They could travel the stars, everything they could bring down, they had anti-gravity, you name it, they could do it. But it wasn't enough for them to connect to that hive mind, the greater consciousness. Technology is not a bridge to God. And I think that's one of the messages which Arthur C. Clarke and also some of the directors of this were trying to get across. Because it wasn't our technology that made us so special to the overmind. Well, there's a couple of things that I wish the show had delved into that the book did. Number one, these aliens were at the end of their line. Okay, they, they, when you get to the end of this show, they, their beings, their uh, culture was not able to do what humans could do. And the overmind forced them into the role of being overlords and supervisors. That, that was their role. They, ha- they were the midwives, if you will, of this process. And in the end of the book, I mean, I don't remember so much of the book except all about the aliens. For some reason, that just jumped out at me, and I never got past the fact they were shaped like demons. But the bottom line here was you actually felt empathy for them because they didn't want to do this role. They didn't want to be a part of this. They had no choice. The overmind went after them. If It was like, you will do this. So they had to be the birth, the 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 midwives, if you will, for lack of a better word, and their their whole species was going to die out, and they were never going to get to do what humans did. It was it, you've actually felt for them in some small way, you know what I'm saying? In the now, program, when, it really depicts that well because it's almost. Yeah. I mean, the character who plays Karelin, all you can really see is his eyes. Really, because yeah, the rest's all right. makeup and CGI, but what a part he plays. And it's almost, as if, it's almost as if that really is the case, Nano. He's trying to figure out what it is the humans have that they don't have that allows the humans to connect to that consciousness. Now, one last thing, and I have to throw this out there, but there was a room in the show that just created automatically, and within it appeared the most majestic kind of hyper-dimensional Ouija board you've ever seen, Nano. And if yeah. that wasn't some kind of quantum communications device, I do not know. Unbelievable, but brilliant how they managed to depict that. Yeah, that was actually very brilliant. My only disappointment technologically was the third episode. My vision of what the kids did to the planet and what they became was very different than what I saw depicted um, on the third on the third episode, so I just have I'm to jump slightly in disappointed because the chat room they're saying sympathy for the devil, and that's the thing. Yes, this wasn't about really the devil per se, because the devil is something that we're programmed to believe right. in. It's an image that we have, and it just so happened that these aliens shared that same image. But they, it wasn't. Karelin was not Satan himself. For me, no. anyway. Maybe some people might take something different from that. But that's the power of the programming that we've had put into us. The fact that- and, let me th- and let me throw this out there before the break. It, it, the other thing that is said there, and there's a quote, and I don't have it exactly, but basically the reason we're afraid of them is we had a premonition of them coming. And they do represent death, our death, the death of humankind. And that, that it's going to be an evolution and they're going to be the midwives, the people. It wasn't sympathy for the devil, you guys. It, when you read the book, what, what you feel for this creature is that they had no choice either. They, the overmind forced them to do this. Bang on, Nano. And for me, when they turn up, it shows you how little free will people actually had. Because yes. what was free will when... There was no struggle anyway, Nano, and I think this whole free will, and to a certain degree, the struggles that we do go through in daily life, and I say that to a certain degree, it's what makes us human, because it inspires us to adapt, create, overcome all the very traits that make us so special, 
so unique, so individual. And that's what we need to worry about, guys, because if there is another alien race out there, when they look at us, they're going to have to be impressed. Because aside from the warring and all the crap like that, we really are quite a unique and a special race. And the minute we actually appreciate that, we'll be more powerful than anything, Nano. Well, and I, the other quote that I loved and I found disturbing and painful, and, and this was a very painful show to watch. I, let me, don't, don't think I was for the devils in any way, but he said the humans believe in so much and know so little. Exactly, and we'll be coming back after the break. This is the Camp Baker Show. Stand tall in the face of tyranny. I want it all, all my freedom and liberty. I'll keep my guns, you can keep your security. I'll stand tall in the face of tyranny. I'll stand tall in the face of tyranny. I want it all, all my freedom and liberty. I'll keep my guns, you can keep your security. I'll stand tall in the face of tyranny. Welcome back to all you bookies out there who nightly stand tall in the face of tyranny. Right here, listening to the Kev Baker Show on www.truthfrequencyradio.com. Now, coming up after Popeye's show tonight, which will be right after my show, is Big Mike and Kristan with the Rundown Live. And a big shout-out to Mike. It's his birthday today, so I will shame you in public, brother. Many, many happy returns. And you know, I don't know, Johnny, would you fancy a a birthday this close to Christmas? No, I think the presents would be pretty crap, Kev. I tell you something, it would be highly expensive being a parent, that's for sure. But much love sent to Mike and Chris Dan. Brilliant show, along with all the other brilliant shows on the network. Now, we've been talking about child Childhood's End, the Arthur C. Clarke book, which was adapted into a TV show on sci-fi, a three-part series. Now, we often talk on the Kev Baker show how synchronicities happen and it was last week we had Anthony Patch on continuing his series of shows which he's shared with us and his research and a lot involves something called a return to the golden age this golden age the dawn of a new day the dawn of a new golden age it's something we hear from people like Jordan Maxwell and a lot of these politicians spout it all the time And it's something that is talked about umpteen times in childhood's end. And this golden age is something not only in a TV show, because it literally is where these elites want to take us. So often on this show, we spoke about how they're trying to change us genetically with the food, the water, the chemtrails, and now physically using CRISPR DNA editing technology. And in the show, one of the characters Milo Rodericks, who's a scientist who is really, really annoyed at the fact that they've killed scientific curiosity. He nails it because he says that we're moving into humanity 2.1. And if you recognize that kind of language, that's because Nano Girl and ourselves here on KBS, we talk about this all the time. In this golden age, Nano, when I first heard them talking about that, on top of the fact I've listened to all of Jordan's Maxwell's research over the years, myself and Johnny have had him on the show. We've had Anthony Patch on about it. This term, this age, it's almost upon us. And I must say, I was startled the amount of times that they were almost conditioning us, like you were saying before, repeating the golden age, the golden age, the golden age, Nano. You know, uh, one of the other icons in this movie, I was very curious to see. Remember in the third episode, the dad says to the family, let's go to the show together as a family. I don't know if you caught what was playing, but it was Jimmy Stewart in the movie Harvey. Harvey is his imaginary friend who is an invisible rabbit down the rabbit hole, i.e., of course, our good friend Popeye. But... um I thought, oh, my God, Alice in Wonderland. Um, yeah, Alice in Wonderland, right? Down the rabbit hole. I thought that was, of all the movies and all the gin joints and all the towns, they played that one. Um, yeah, to, I caught that, that they actually had a version. Um, I really, I recommend the book to anybody who'd like to read read a little bit more about 
where Arthur C. Clarke took the, the characters. When I read the book, and I, I did, let me say this about the show. I felt that it captured the feeling of the book. I think that Sci-Fi Channel, whoever did this, did a very excellent job of capturing the tone of the book, staying true to the story. I felt like, you know, a lot of times you read a book and they go so far down, you know, another rabbit hole that they don't stay true to the story. And when I got done watching the show, I had the same feeling I did from the book. It's very bittersweet. But when you think about the, the, the title, Childhood's End, you know, in a lot of ways, and especially listening to Catherine Austin Fitz the other day, she was talking about the end of fairy tales, and that so many of us are waiting for Donald Trump or some hero or a leader or somebody to save us right now. And it's going to be up to us to wake up and to save ourselves. And in a way, we are in a childhood's end, Kev, but the difference is we have to volunteer for this. We have to be a part of that decision, and I think that's the huge difference right there. Absolutely, and you know, I haven't read the book, but this childhood's end, when the overlords turn up and basically say that this was always Earth's destiny, it was almost as if that was the end of the infancy for the planet and all its occupants, and it was time to grow up, because yeah. this is what happens. It's a process that happens over and over again. And John, you know, what really struck me one part as well from this TV show was the fact that when the child, the young blonde boy, he um, talks about when he's taken away to where the overlords come from, and he talks about a fiery place, and all he can see is one eye. And you know, you've got Milo at one point drawing the triangles with the eye in the middle. You see the Illuminati symbol a lot. And it's almost possibly a tongue-in-cheek way of saying to us via the directors, because they always try and portray messages here, hidden in different layers, that the overlords right now, who basically in the TV show we give up all our rights to and just put our trust in, well, that's the governmental Illuminati system that exists right here, just now. Well, what if... Instead of talking about the golden age, Kev, they actually mean golden years because somebody in their golden years is maybe at the last 20 years of their life. So maybe that, maybe it was only they had 20 years left on on Earth because it, it took that, that time um, to take the children no, and the planet in destruction. It's certainly, there's so many ways you can look at this. And of course, this isn't going to be the first golden age we have had. There's talk of golden ages before and then past civilizations being wiped out for one reason or another. Now, we all know that right here on Earth, that isn't going to be the case this time because we're far more clever this time. We know what tricks they can throw at us, Nano Girl. And like you say, it is up to us and be it an alien race, a government, or no matter what it is or who it is, we can't give up our own strength. We have the power. Don't be looking for anything out there to help us. Yeah, I mean, and, and I uh, again, I, I highly recommend that interview because she talks about fairy tales. I really like the way she has such a powerful way of de-escalating the you know the the war machine and all of the news crap and just putting it in a place where you can just say okay I can do this but another quote from the show and I love this quote and maybe this is kind of what we're also talking about is this is when Corellian talks to I think um, one of the characters the act of dying is the act of life Marcus Aurelius and I thought about that and in the end um, not to be too much of a spoiler alert, but what the children do is take us to the next evolution. And Arthur C. Clarke doesn't tell you what that means or what that looks like. And, you know, I don't, you know it's like we come here and we have a, a finite amount of time and no one knows how much we have. And that may be true for the humans and the dinosaurs and everybody else that's ever kind of trooped through here. 
is you have a certain, maybe we all come with a certain amount of time and we have to do the best that we can with it. And maybe when Arthur C. Clarke wrote this, I mean, he was one of the powers that be, right? Wasn't he connected to those guys? He's so connected and get this, Nano. I was reading today that his good friend, Stanley Kubrick, the director, he originally went to make this into a movie round about the time where he ended up making 2001 A Space Odyssey. However, he was having a bit of a spat with Arthur C. Clarke at the time and he couldn't get the rights to make the movie. But just imagine if he had made the film of Childhood's End instead of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Wow. I, I'm actually glad he didn't do it because I, I think this production was brilliant and I actually think it was timely and disturbing all at the same time. And I think that um, he did a, he did it was good he did what he did and I think this was timely for us at this moment now. And I, urge, to, I urge anyone ahead. out there, yeah. it doesn't matter how long myself, Nano, Johnny or anyone else spends talking about this, right. A, you need to read the book and B, you need to see this latest adaptation because, like Nano says, very timely. And for me, there's a lot of hidden truths in there. Maybe it's because now we're getting to a level where we're so well versed in all the topics that are current right now. Maybe that's it. I don't know. But there's a lot to be gleaned from these TV shows and it seems to be getting more so, Nano. Well, and I also think we're smart enough to pick up the crap. I mean, I, I again, I was disturbed for uh, more and more for the people of faith that they believe very strongly. I think that they bring a lot to our society, and they don't need to be maligned or treated in a, in a certain way. I and I, I don't even, I really don't remember if that was in the book or not. But anyway, very interesting. I think it also showed the fact that. Gathering round the campfire and singing Kumbaya didn't work either because people were very disillusioned and wanted back to their old ways again. Absolutely. Very quickly. Absolutely. And during the show, they showed this. They'd done a really brilliant way. They showed how there was something called the Freedom League. Now, they were using the internet to put out videos comparing people's apathy to similar to the times of World War II. The Europeans just rolling over as the Nazis would come in. And that is kind of what it was like. And, you know, you take it further from there because people really did not like this end to creativity. They wanted to move back to the old ways, as Johnny said. And I suspect people like us, before too long, we would figure out what was going on. And there was a place in the book and the show called New Athens, Now, this was a place where a deal had been done with the overlords that they would be left alone to live in the old ways. But, Nano, when time came, well, it didn't save them from anything, did it? Well, no, but I think, I don't, I'm not sure that they went there to get saved. I think that they got there so that they could have some semblance of who they were as humans and something from their past that they could recognize and connect to. And they could bring back their art and their artistic drive. They were the kind of people, like one of the main characters says, I just want a job. He goes, can you imagine a job? I want a job. And I, of course, last night I'm thinking, I don't know if everybody paid for everything. But I mean, I'm thinking Star Trek. I mean, the whole concept of Star Trek is you get to choose, again, choice. You get to choose what you want to do in that lifetime There is no hunger, there's no homelessness, and everybody has something that they choose and society is taken care of. And And I I just, you know, but again, they risked their lives on those spaceships. They had to work. It wasn't like an easy, I don't do anything when I'm on, you know, the Enterprise. And you know, Nana, we talk often on this show about alien invasions, fake alien invasions, and you know, the perception of an alien invasion is all it will take. Because these people, they did not physically see these beings, they did not physically touch them, they could only see the ships, they could hear the voice, and they were given the message. And you know, it takes me back to that Von Braun warning to Dr. Carol Rosen, where she was told that there would be the Cold War, the Russian threat, then international terrorism coming out of the Middle East, 
and then we would have asteroids and then this alien invasion, a fake one. And what a perfect technique it would be from the powers that be to actually pull off the movement into what was called on the program the World Federation or was what we would call the New World Order, the Golden Age. I don't think they have to do that anymore, Kev. I think that, that they've put in enough doubt and enough crap in all of the stuff that we love that that none of us, that they could do whatever they want. Look what happened when they did the test rocket. Everybody went cuckoo. We already don't trust them. We already don't believe them. They could land. They could take over. We wouldn't believe it anyway. Some of us might. I mean, they don't even have to. I really think they don't have to pretend anymore. The little neural network has been built up there in our brains. All they have to do is talk on the squawk machine. Absolutely. And the kind of stuff that you cover on the show, Nano, we have to think that this is probably 50 years behind what they're using on us now. So they're so far advanced in their program, and I'll use that word quite aptly, because we're talking about TV programs tonight, and everything, the timing of it, this is definitely all put out there for a reason. And Nano, I do actually agree with you there. I think they have got us in that state now. Just look at the power of a polar bear. It's got people and countries ready to give up all their sovereignty just to pay Al Gore and all the rest of them to save that very polar bear from that shrinking ice. Oh, dear. I weep. (laughs) (laughs) But that takes us into these political asshats, nano girl. And you were going to have a political update. What's been happening? The Trump, he's still at it. Oh, my God. We're only, and and to anybody out there, please don't groan. This is all going to be fun stuff tonight. Uh, This is going to be lighthearted, making fun of everybody. Okay, so we had two grueling, nauseating, somebody give me a pound of chocolate uh, debates. The demos debated, which I skipped. I'm sorry. There isn't any reason I would ever listen to her for longer than that. Nah, never. And then the Repubbers, which I went to my little site that I go to and kept it off caps and listened. Um, I, 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 it doesn't matter who's won. I think everybody throws a bunch of stuff out there. Um, I don't know. But uh, so here's the headlines this week. So Hillary, uh, Hillary said that she's that that ISIS is using uh, Trump uh, as a recruiting tool. And Trump is demanding an apology from Hillary, as she said that the Trump video is and he feels like that's she as he said about her, she lies and lies and lies. Um it was pretty funny. Um, I don't know still who owns Trump, how he's standing there. I'm still kind of, you know, I, I, but I do love the fact that he's doing the deal. And then during the Democratic uh, debates, which, of course, I avoided, Jebber, yes, Jeb Bush, decided to shoot himself in the tweetosphere. And I guess he started landing all over Hillary. And here were some of the quotes from his fellow tweeters. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Dear Jeb, and you won't do that to the middle class. So he made some comments about how he would treat things differently. And they're like, yeah, you wouldn't do that to the middle class while cutting it out of the one percenters. Please lie to us like your dad did. Did you want to jump in here? Go ahead. No, it was just a really quick point on the Trump yeah, go ahead. Clinton thing because – She accuses him of being a recruitment tool, yet if you actually go through the recruitment videos and some of the propaganda videos that ISIS put out, one of the stars that they use is, drumroll please, Bill Clinton, and they cite his womanizing ways as a reason to come and join the caliphate, ooga booga. So really, she got that back to front, and let's not mention all the airstrikes that kill innocent people and turn ordinary people like me, you, everyone else out there, into peoples with revenge on their mind. And when a group like ISIS is the way to seek that revenge, really, she shouldn't be throwing stones in glass houses, Nano. Actually, Obama Nokia's done a pretty good job of recruiting them, too. Just a I little bit. Your, just a tiny touch. Uh, here's my favorite, a couple of my favorites. Your brother doesn't raise tax, taxes. He puts his wars on a credit card. 
Um, well, at least they can run a, a campaign, Mr. 3%, as opposed to sending Americans to their death in illegal wars like your family did. Nothing like listening to a guy polling at 3%, act like Ooh. people care what he has to say. That and then at one like point, a hot knife through butter. <laughs> my favorite is go wait in the truck. <laughs> Anyway, it goes on. There was, I mean, they just absolutely ate his lunch. Well, over here on the UK media today, all they're talking about Obama is the fact that he managed to chip in from just off the green while playing a round of golf. Ah, it's oh. unbelievable, Nano. This is the disconnect. This is the mainstream media. This is the gump that they are giving us. While at the same time, we've got everything else that's going on in the world. No, no. Obama is quite good at his golf game. No bloody wonder he's been on the course the whole time of his presidency. Yeah, I know. And one of my favorite comments, and the other thing that happened this week, and this is one of my favorite comments, I love this, is that evidently the New York Times, somebody did an article on this guy and quoted him exactly. And it said, the quote was, Obama indicated that he did not see enough cable television to fully appreciate the anxiety after the attacks in Paris and San Bernardino. So here's the deal on that comment. That was posted on Thursday um, from the New York Times. Obama's handlers went absolutely ballistic on that because that makes him sound like a sociopath who has no empathy and no feelings, which he is. And they never got it removed from the Internet. And I just... I, uh, it is so perfect. If you ever thought or didn't think that this guy was a sociopath, that says it right there. He could watch 5,000 videos on our opinion and what's going on and how scared we are or whatever we are. He wouldn't get it. He can't. You, you, if you're a sociopath, you have no ability to connect. That's why he said that. Well, I guess I need to watch TV. Absolutely. What? But what's it like living under Emperor Obama over there, Nana? Oh, I want to tell you that that I thank my lucky stars every single day that although I can't afford a whole bunch of good stuff, I know my tax dollars are making sure that he and his sweet darling wife and kids are in Hawaii spending millions and millions of dollars on their Christmas vacay. Don't I mean if I could get the Fed to print me off dollars and get you guys to pay me back, I would do it as well. I know it. You've got to laugh at the ridiculousness of this, but you know, our very good friends Aaron and Melissa Dykes, they shared a video in the past couple of days. Nano, you gave that to me tonight, and I think this is a highly relevant time to play this. And this comes from the guys over at Truth Stream Media. So sit yeah. back and enjoy this. Uh oh, our team is a little stuck. (laughs) Well, that's it, folks. The White House has finally admitted that we're an empire. So, this is a little different than our usual news conference, but uh, I kind of like the feel of it. I hope it looks as good as it feels. In a really stupid movie tie-in that's actually very fascist to have the state help promote a corporate activity. But whatever, really stupid. But obviously we're uh, very grateful to the, uh, the folks at Disney that are uh, here ho- helping us host a... Uh... <laughs> Apparently r is taking questions now. Uh, but we're obviously very grateful to the people at Disney. I mean, when you go around playing the Imperial March and hanging out with stormtroopers, you're trying to say that you're evil, that you're with Darth Vader, that you're with the dark side, and that you're an evil empire. So what is the message here? So this is a little different than our usual news conference, but uh, I kind of like the feel of it. I hope it looks as good as it feels. This guy obviously doesn't know what irony means. I told you guys he was a douche. (laughs) So that was our beloved uh, Josh Ernest. 
the uh, the spokesperson for the White House. And so here he is on stage at the White House, and the stormtroopers are behind him. And isn't it ironic that little R2-D2 cannot get on the stage? You think you would have thought of that before, like giving the guy a ramp? But no Jedi Knights, no Yoda, nothing, nothing from the light. I'm surprised Darth didn't show up. And I love it. I kind of like the feel of it. I hope it looks as good as it feels. You know what, Josh? Let me tell you what it looks like. It looks like the truth, and you hardly ever go near that. So well, thank you. I'm telling you, Nano, Darth Cheney, he is out <sighs> in the Earth cloud right now, and he's actually looking at building one of these NASA-hyped asteroid-come-death star-type things. Wouldn't it be so apt if they just moved from the White House and Parliament and all the other governmental buildings around the world and just made their way up to some kind of Death Star? Wouldn't that be more appropriate? That's the kind of empire that we're living in now, Nano. Well, Elon Musk had a very good run with his uh, uh, spaceship yesterday, right? Awesome. The, uh, awesome. Yes. Do you think we could put you know who and you know who and a whole bunch of you know who on there and let them go to the moon or Mars first? I vote. Only after they- myself and Popeye <laughs> move there and open up the much talked about and hyped Sitchin's Kitchen. <gasps> no, let's send them first. <laughs> <laughs> I need customers. Let's make it a reality there, show. But now. This has been the Christmas Cracker, and we're almost out of time, as per usual. Have you had fun tonight and this year? Oh, it's been a great year. It's been awesome being with you guys. And we have the best listeners, the best people in the chat room. And I just want to wish everybody a very, very Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. And we will be back on Tuesday, right? Yes, All we'll live have our shows. 2015 year review maybe maybe the oh. false flaggies will be handing out a few awards to the crisis actors who knows Mano? <laughs> we can take it anywhere but johnny whistles i know that you've been suffering with a sore throat tonight man the listeners appreciate you not only waking up but struggling through the pain johnny how you doing i'm okay kev getting there and you know, you're my mouth while you just get into the bad part. But so all you, love bookies, the show. all you bookies out there, send Johnny some much needed love and energy. Remember, guys, keep it real. And wherever you are, make it T E R. And Denny Chuck Chuck Dial. Not y'all. And stay tuned for Popeye coming right up.